Welcome for the first time at the HNL Network Report. Uh, for the first time, we're going to do the Seattle Kraken and our co-host, uh, Stratsik, will be with us uh, tonight uh, talking about the Seattle Kraken. We're going to review a little bit their off-season uh, 2022. And, of course, the main camp. And finally, we're going to give you a little bit more information about the preview of the main camp start uh, uh, honestly, today, September 22nd, 2022. So, Stratzik, welcome aboard of the Hockey Nation Live Show family, my friend. Pleasure to be here. Let's start in with the couple of more happening for the Seattle Kraken. We know last year, their first uh, year in NHL, Ron Francis, I did not really like what he did overall uh, during his uh, draft expansion. If you that, but this year, I gave him a, a star of the summer with maybe two other teams. I think they did very well, the Seattle Kraken. What a chance from one year to another year, Ron Francis did. So tell us a bit more about what happening with the Seattle Kraken about their move during the summer. Well, first of all, last season was was tough to watch for Kraken fans. Um, and uh, obviously with the, the situation at the draft with Shane Wright, that brought a lot of hope. Um, to the franchise, but then uh, in free agency, to see really the all, almost all the main complaints um, from the fan base about building an entertaining uh, hockey team to watch in their expansion years, um, a real focus on addressing those specific needs, namely scoring and uh, doing it in a number of different ways, both through trade and in free agency. Um, has really uh, buoyed the spirits of the fan base. I would say people are um, are kind of excited. I don't think the ex expectations are for playoffs or anything like that, but definitely a more competitive, more exciting team. The Andre Burakovsky signing, in particular, um, there was a lot of talk going into free agency about maybe landing really the marquee players um, because of the cap space that uh, Francis had. Um, maintained through all of last year. So there was money to go out and get guys like um, Johnny Goudreau or Philip Forsberg. But instead, I think, um, or Nazem Kadri was also a, a player that was discussed um, as a potential acquisition. Um, but the way that they've gone about acquiring players on a little bit shorter term, a little bit less AAV, and in some ways, kind of, you know, knock on wood, bulletproof contracts that are not going to um, tie the team into a bloated cap structure early. Like Andre Burakovsky at $5 million for five years is is fantastic in my books, especially like um, last year they went after Jaden Schwartz and they like gave him a no and, and um, uh, Philip Grubauer and kind of did like – like, like instant no trade clauses, like very player friendly, um, ex almost excessively player friendly contracts. Uh, Burkowski being a, you know, a two time cup winner with a defensive reputation and, um, a, uh, limited no, no trade clause, not a complete no trade uh, clause from the start of the contract. Um, even if he uh, doesn't cover the bet offensively with in increased minutes, that's a contract that, you know, can probably still be moved out just based on his pedigree. Um, if two or three years down the line, it's not working out, it's structured in a way, given his reputation, that it's not going to sink the team. Uh, same with Bjorkstrand. Um, trading for him, he's got a little bit more money. Um, maybe a little bit more difficult to move, but still, given the numbers that he's um, put up and the trajectory he's on, that uh, I think was a – everyone was kind of waiting for, for, for what Ron Francis would do with this $7 million in cap space that sort of had just been floating around the team. And everyone's wondering, like, are you going to do something? The team is losing. Are you going to make the move? And he really waited to the moment of maximum opportunity. Uh, to take, well, I won't say take advantage of a, a, a cap strap team, but to, um, you know, he was obviously looking for th that kind of situation that Columbus had found themselves in. 
Great point sure because a... great point what you said because I was just watching I'm uh, just uh, reading the cap friendly and they have no contract yeah. at any moment over six million dollars they are all below six million dollars I could be wrong here but I think the max is five years or less so he did not commit himself to anybody else where he could um, create some damage a long term I think that's a great way to uh, build that team and part of that is being sort of um you know, for, not forced into that situation, but with um, the Beneers contract and potentially the right contract, potentially even hopefully being, you know, significant contracts, they've definitely future-proofed the, the cap structure in a way that, you know, they can, they can pay these guys once they come off their ELCs. Yeah, absolutely right about this. If they want to do that. Yep. It was a pretty good summer for them. Uh, for the Seattle Kraken. So the next subject I want to talk tonight is, uh, of course, is the rookie cam. And uh, before we start with review cam, I want to talk a little bit more about the NHL draft 2022 in Montreal. He hit the home run over there too. Talk about um, Shane Wright, number four. I think if he was said to anybody at the, before the, the draft start, the Seattle Kraken is going to draft Shane Wright, everybody was laughing because they would never expect to be at the four uh, overall pick at that moment, and then he finally he slipped under their hands. So there's great selection about this. But I want to talk about uh, Jagger uh, uh, Furcus, uh, 35 overall. Uh, Jimmy Neyman is another one. David Coyette, 61. That's a pretty good one. Uh, Ty Nelson, the first overall pick uh, at 16 years old in OHL. It's a four players he pick during the summer. I Tell you right now, those pick Gayet, Nelson, and Neman could become a great asset for the Saddle Kraken in the long term. So I, you ha we have to, as if you are a Saddle Kraken fans, uh, applause what Francis did during the NHL draft. Yeah, uh, uh, I went to both days of rookie camp and uh, to sort of get a look at the these players. Uh, Goyet in particular really impressed me. Uh, I, I'd been following um, Jager Furcus a little bit more, even preceding the draft. Um, he was definitely someone kind of on the Seattle fan base's radar. I think part of it, his personality, his, you know, style, his name kind of, you know, jumped out at people. And I think, okay, this is a really interesting guy and sort of fitting the Seattle um, mold. They, they, uh, they have a, a fair number of like uh, what you, might describe as undersized players. Yep. Yanni Gord, um, Carson Kuhlman is also someone they brought back who's a smaller player that seems to fit high energy players that kind of fit into this um, mold that they try to build in the first year, which is like a heavy four, not a heavy four checking team, but a speedy four checking team. Didn't really work out in the first year, but um, Furcus is definitely a player that feels like a Seattle Kraken, a natural Kraken um, for their team identity. And um, at rookie camp, just the more the drills became scrimmage-like, just the more he kind of stood out. Um, and particularly his ability to find open space and get himself open for that one-timer shot. Um, some of the other uh, rookies, you know, they would get into the in, into the soft spaces. Obviously, it's just drills, so there's a lot of open space. They only brought three defensemen to the rookie camp. Oh, so, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, they had 11 forwards, three defense, and one goalie. Okay. So, um, but but Furcus, um, definitely his, his shot, his one-timer, his ability to open up his frame quickly at, at the right moment. Um, was giving him uh, much better shots than some of the other rookies. Um, I would say that also that another standout from camp was Riker Evans, who um, was someone they drafted in their first year. And um, because they were so forward heavy, like a lot of these drills were very forward centric drills. So he was basically just doing kind of forward drills and he looked like a forward, like his hands in tight around the net, very impressive. Ty Nelson, a, a bit of a different guy. Sometimes, you know, very good, highly mobile skater. Um, but sometimes, you know, he would get to the front of the net on some of these like breakaway drills and so on. And it would be like, ah, like, what am I supposed to do here? But uh, <laughs> Evans, uh, Evans was, was like, he, uh, yeah, I was like, oh, yeah, that's Riker Evans. I thought he was a forward. Like, um, 
It's one of those 35 year old pick thing. like um, like a focus. So they, both year they pick up pick up a great player, so 35 year old. So that's a great job for them. Uh, so honestly, the the big star, or the the person, the people want to hear most about Shane Wright. Maybe in one or two minutes, tell us a bit more what he looked like on the ice overall. So Shane Wright is a is an interesting cat. <laughs> um, so uh, during rookie camp. The first impression of him was he was just doing a, they were just doing rush drills and they didn't have, you know, many defenders. So they had the coaches out there, the Coachella Valley coaching staff in the neutral zone, just basically playing cursory defense. Um, and Sheen Wright comes in on his first rush of rookie camp and Jessica Campbell, who's the, uh, the new assistant coach of the, uh, of the Firebirds under uh, Dan Balsma, uh, actually poke checks the puck off his stick. Um, and Wright just does a, like a mini stick slam and his whole body tenses up and he, you know, the body language was just like, I was like, okay, this is interesting. This, this is a, <laughs> that was an interesting reaction. Um, you know, it for a drill, like in a very, you know, casual kind of rookie camp. Um, and there was another, there was another moment like that on the first day where he was a, uh, was struggling and again like another mini stick slam and the contrast between him and the other players who are clearly just you know very happy to be there um (laughs) and right who is kind of like getting mad at himself for you know getting poke checked by a coach in a in a drill and then later on they um they structured the, the the rookie camp so that about a third of it maybe a quarter to a third was just him and maddie beniers working together um separated from all the other rookies so they kind of had high intensity competitive drills, but then they also just had him and Maddie building uh, chemistry together. They seem to be like um, have a very good rapport. Um, they would often give them a whole side of the ice to work on one timers. One drill, they had Riker Evans come down and deliver passes from the point, and um, Maddie left shot on the right side was just automatic on the one timers, just putting them into the open net, and. Uh, they, then they had uh, Shane Wright on the other side of the top of the other circle, and he just could not get it in the net. Like, really, uh, just shot after shot after shot was really starting to get frustrated. And you know, Maddie called over to him from the other side of the ice and was kind of giving him advice. And eventually, he ended the drill. He did get one in, and kind of did a, like a little mock celebration. <laughs> um, but I just it just made me think of like that clip from development camp with Yuri Slavkovsky. Uh, where he was struggling to keep the puck, like it was getting, like you can take like ten, you can take like a, like a two minute clip of any player and and just yeah they'll look terrible right, and yeah. it just reminded me of that situation. I was thinking like if he was in Montreal, what that would have you know what that would have been like um, for him to just be missing open one timer after open one timer after open one timer. He's on a um, nice spot, but then. He is. Well, then the second day, I mean, he was he he was complaining to Balsma but it, during a drill like Balsma's like, what? like I'm trying to run the drill. And uh, he actually ended the rookie camp um, with just two like bellowing F-bombs um, oh, yeah. in frustration. They, but at the end of it all, like. After it was over, he went out and he did just for, I think, 15 minutes. was just practicing face-offs with Matty Beniers and laughing it up. And, like, none of the – none of the – all the frustration was gone. Um, and then talked with the media and all the frustration was gone. Just a very, like, emotive individual. Obviously emotive in a way that none of the other rookies were. Kind of getting special treatment none, none of the other rookies had. And but just switching back and forth between this highly negative to like highly positive, just a very interesting player, um, and and definitely driven and frustrated. Like he wants to make this team so badly that yeah. any minor mistake in a drill is the world to him. Um, that's just how it came off. Um, but it was good to see. And and Maddie as this force to kind of like cool down his personality. Maddie Beniers is such a cool, relaxed character. Yeah. And none of the coaches were like calling him out for his emotiveness. They would just you know kind of be like you know just engage him in a friendly way, and he would just go back to go back to normal. 
just very interesting dynamic, interpersonal yeah, dynamic. It looked like movies. about this one over there. And we're almost at the end of the show, so let's move on a little bit. Yeah. Maybe not the prediction of the team, but a little bit more about, you know, the preview main, uh, main camp start right now. The main camp start uh, right now for two weeks, honestly. And maybe tell us a little bit more what, what spot or what job is open up over there, what your expectation a bit during the main camp, what you're looking for, and give us uh, for the Kraken fans what – are your impression for the main camp for the Krakens coming? I would say, well, okay, so there's two there, There's two main things. One is how ready is Brandon Tanev going to be and Jaden Schwartz? They're both coming off of injuries. They both yep. skated in scrimmage. I got to watch them skate in scrimmage. Uh, Tanev was clearly not 100%, he, um, but was definitely a full participant. Uh, wasn't red jersey or anything like that. Um, but you could tell he still is working on his lower body after that ACL injury that he had in the middle of last year. Yeah. So that could be interesting. He will, it seems like he'll be participating in camp. Yeah. So that, that might leave an opening for a player early in the season as well as Schwartz. It's unclear. I think his is more of an upper body injury. It was a little bit tougher to see what state he was at in the scrimmage. Um, but, but if both those guys are back, um, it definitely closes up the opportunities for players to come in. I would say the two players that they were, that seem like they might have a chance um, are Shane Wright, obviously, and uh, who is present at, uh, who is a full participant in media day, but also Riker Evans, who they had at media day doing kind of like the main team, you know, like headshots and videos and, um, and the fact that when they separated off Maddie and, uh, and Shane Wright, they also had uh, Ray Evans involved in in the in those kinds of drills with with him as well. Is maybe a tell that they kind of view him as being you know at a different level than the the other players. And it'll be interesting to see where he fits in if he does make the team, if he's a seventh defenseman, um, or if he's able to you know spell in for Carson Soucy, who had a very good year last year, in my opinion. That left defense. Um, seems pretty set. Um, the right defense is interesting because they've got uh, Adam, Adam Larson, Larson and Justin, yeah, Schultz. Justin Schultz who are locks, but then they've got their, their uh, third pairing right D is Will Borgen, who yep. was a big surprise last year. It took him a while to get into the lineup, but when he did was very impressive, but he still only has something like 50 NHL games over two seasons. So um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens in that. Uh, and then that, they pick uh, up the guy from Washington Capitals, uh, Kempney, uh, is yes. on one way yep. experience who have some problem yep. with injury for the last two years, uh, honestly. Uh, yeah. So the on a, the top seven is pretty much, uh, you know, you you don't have m- not many spot as a defenseman over there. When you talk about uh, mm-hmm. Ole Chak, uh, Don Larson, Schultz, Susi, uh, Borgen, and just maybe yeah. Kempney. And when so. you go to and when you go to the roster construction, like uh, there's Coolman, and then there's also um, Cole Lind, who is someone who kind of became more of a regular yeah. uh, toward the end of last year. Um, obviously, very different player. There's a three year age difference, and Cole Lind is, you know, potentially, you know, he's got. Uh, RFA, so he's price control. So it'll be interesting to see. That's a little bit of a battle on right wing. There's also questions about like, you know, where do you put Shane Wright? Do you play him uh, as a center or do you try moving him to wing? You know, do you maybe put him on Maddie Meniere's wing, right? You're, you're spending all this time in camp building chemistry between the two of them. Do you give them a chance to work together or is that just on the power play? Like, And because you have all these players of similar kind of like contract and, and term length, you have a lot of very similar players. Yeah. So there's, uh, you know, figuring out who your, you know, your first line is versus your second line versus your third is a little bit more difficult than um, other teams because the, the skill levels are a little bit more horizontal across the team. The key for Shane, so, right? Like they cannot keep him like a full line. He need to be on the top nine yeah. over there. And you think about this, it's not a bad team. Like the forward, it's not bad. You think about Iberle, Schwartz, uh, Burakowski, Buckstrom, Gord, McCann. Um, right there, that give you uh, already like a uh, five players. We have Danev is not on that list over there. They have Kiki, Donskui, mm-hmm. Wember, and then they have Donado, which just signed a contract. 
So it's getting jam and what I'll talk about Matt uh, Bernie. So um um do you believe he yeah, would make it a... or not? Shane Wright. Oh Shane Wright. Um I think for sure he's going to make it. I mean, okay. just the amount of promotion, the marketing promotion they're putting behind him. At the very least for nine games at the start of the yeah, season. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, if makes absolutely cr- if he absolutely craters in those nine games, then, you know, maybe there's a conversation about Great. sending him back to junior. Great comments about but that. But yeah. also, you know, you need to maintain the relationship. And this is not like a contending year for the team. Uh, yeah. Probably not even for the playoffs. So... You know, sending him to junior could sour that relationship with the team a little bit. And, you know, the politics of these relationships with, you know, the higher end draft picks are, are pretty important. It, it would take, I think it would take a lot for him to not see more than those nine games. But if he's clearly out of his depth, then, you know, he might not make the team uh, yeah. after the nine games. So that's what we're looking for for the for the main camera over there. We'll definitely go back next couple of weeks talking about the Kraken. Uh, this is the first time. We really appreciate this, let's say, to give us your information, what's going on with the Kraken. Uh, and then I believe this thing is going to be really more entertaining, better compared to year number one. Like you said, it's a process. It's a patient over there for the fans. But like you, the fans want more, right? They want not only winning, but more uh, entertaining at the game is a great crowd is a great location and i think only thing i think the next couple of years it would be the the team's going to get better and better with the draft pick they're going to get uh, for the next two more years of course uh, so that i expect a lot for the seattle kraken and uh, we'll see what happening about this so uh, any comments you want to talk before we uh, shut down the the, the show yeah, I do want to talk a little bit about the goaltending situation uh, because I think it speaks to what you're saying, like the, the great home arena environment. Um, Phil Grubauer struggled so much last year, and yet it went like a truly bad goaltending performance, particularly at the start of the year. Uh, he was a bit better to finish the year. Um, but the support that he is feeling from the fans, uh, the Gru chants, um, he, you know, despite having this, you know, almost infamously poor, uh, post free agent signing, uh, season, uh, you know, at the end of the year, there he was, he was collecting the, uh, the, the, the team award for, I think it was like most first stars of wow. the season. So, you know, when he succeeded in that at home, you know, they, they would, you know, reward him with the first star, you know, when he makes a save, they reward him with the Gru chant, just an immense amount of support for um, a struggling player. Um, as an Oilers fan, very almost unusual. Usually when players are struggling, fans can be very severe and harsh. And certainly, you know, some have had problems with Grubauer, but it, it really speaks to some of the, I think, not unique, but special qualities of the fan base that, that he has received so much support and, I believe we'll continue to receive that 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 support, and it's going to be a test to see, you know, if um, if this very highly positive fan and media environment kind of uh, like a no bad vibes, all good vibes environment can kind of help the help the team become a, spe- a special successful environment that's a bit unlike some other markets. Yeah, definitely. And then we know Martin John is the backup over there because the Chris Drager yep. uh, got injured for, you know, will be out for a couple of months. So if some, uh, John would bring some kind of veteran leadership inside that room uh, for sure. So it would be interesting and for also, the upcoming yeah. year. And also the way that they've supported the, the coaching staff, I think, are, are supporting Grubauer also by bringing in Steve Briere, uh, by making a change at the goalie coach position. Um because he, you know, he was having some technical, you know, there, there were some issues with the defense, maybe not su- supporting um, supporting him as much earlier in the season. But there were some issues of him, you know, kind of uh, losing his angle a little bit, overplaying the puck, leaving holes, just kind of technical um, issues that, you know, if they're addressed, um, could really radically improve his performance. And... Um, for a team that's you know very loyal to their coaching staff, they didn't make any changes during the year. They waited till the off season to do everything um, to 
to make a change like this is kind of significant for that. Um, yeah, only one year. Of- if you think about this, it's only one year. Yeah. So uh, SC been with the Toronto Maple Leaf for a couple of years. You have a six, five, six, five, five, six year now and NHL as yeah. a coach. And uh, if you think about what he worked with, Jim Raymer, Frederick Anderson, um, you know, uh, Jonathan Bernier, if you think about all those golden that have been with the Toronto Maple Leaf, And what they became after they left this organization, they let them better uh, like nobody did with them. And you can see they've been uh, successful, whatever they've been after that. So uh, you have to give credit for Sebra, yeah. yeah. Whatsoever, people blame a lot of Toronto Maple Leaf, but uh, uh, he's going to be helping uh, Grubauer for sure, the goaltending over there. So uh, that'd be awesome. And we appreciate your time, Stratik, with us today. And that's concluded, guys, the first uh, episode of the HNL uh, Network uh, Team Report of the Cerro Kraken. I can't wait to see you for until the next time uh, talking about the Cerro Kraken. Uh, thanks so much for listening and watching another video of the Hockey Nation Live Show. <laughs>